We're doing a series called Big Answers for Big Questions. And it comes right out of 1 Peter 3.15. Always be ready to give an answer for your faith. And so we want to do that. So I'm just going to read this. And then I'm going to say something like, this is the word of the Lord. I'm going to ask you to say amen, because it is the word of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Okay. Suffering for... Okay. But in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect. This is the word of the Lord. Amen. You may take a seat. All right. I've asked one of our wonderful ladies to come and read our scripture for today. Can we get this mic up and ready to go? One, two. This is Gemma. What do you do at our church? You haven't been here long, but you kind of rush straight into serving. Is that just something wrong with you? Or is that what you think church is? Is that what you think church is? Fantastic. So you're involved in Sunday school. Okay. Which we call Transformers. Um, okay. Not anymore. Then. Great. You're going to read scripture to us. I'm reading from Luke 16, 19, 31. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and he feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish and in this flame. But Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and Lazarus in like manner bad things, but now he is comforted him and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come to this place of torment. But Abraham said, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Fantastic. Thank you, Gemma. Wonderful. Wow. Um, One of those those biggies. Um, I don't know. But just hold that in mind. Um, Just Jesus telling a parable. Um, telling a a story with um, spiritual connections and spiritual meaning um, to people um, as we kind of get started off. But I just wanted to literally a one minute um, sort of update of what what I was up to last week, Sunday, Um, went to the United States to spend time with one of the guys who's kind of speaking into the life of our church as we've really enjoying kind of family relationships and uh, a kind of guy who just comes and speaks to us as a team and helps us learn to lead together. But um, we ended up going to a church called New Life Chicago. which um, was really the kind of key point of the trip. One of the things that uh, Andy and myself and the leadership team and the growing leadership team have dreamed is to, to be a great uh, big church that serves Watford, but to actually be meeting um, in multiple locations. So we do big, we've got the resource and the impact of big, but we're actually serving local communities in locally embedded, locally pastored, locally caring for church communities. That's our dream. So I'd love to be a church of 2,000 people in Watford, but probably 10 to 12 sort of congregations throughout Gost and Bushy, Watford Central, Watford West, uh, that sort of idea. So we went and visited a church that are fulfilling this in Chicago. 19 locations, 34 services a Sunday, 5,500 people attending, but no church is bigger than 600 people. So there's still that kind of kind of intimate, 600 is still too big for me, I think, but there's this intimacy and there's this genuine pastoral life taking place within your community, but the resource to do unbelievable amounts, you've got men free to pastor because all the kind of um, administrative and all these things are done in a central kind of place and uh, it just set free young um, and older uh, people to, to pastor and to love their congregation. So really inspired by that, provoked by that, going to bring that back to the leadership team, talk that through, but that's what I was doing last week. So um, 
We're in a series called Big Answers for Big Questions, all kind of built out of this idea we want to be evangelists. There's a gift of evangelism. So there are some people who literally saw at telling people about Jesus. I'm not one of them, by the way. But there are others, probably more like myself, who kind of find that sometimes a little difficult, find, find opening those doors and connecting with people and bringing up things about the gospel and things about Jesus a little bit harder. But we don't get to cop out. <laughs> because we have the Holy Spirit and because we're all evangelists, we've got to share the story. So as a church, we've really been focusing kind of the, the, the most of this year and definitely up until the summer at least on what it is to be evangelistic. And one of the key things we thought is equipping people to have answers for big questions that people in our culture are asking. And uh, so we come to um, hell, really? And Father God, I think it's pretty obvious that I'm just going to need your Holy Spirit to, to guide me, to guide us in this. It's one of those topics that's just really, um, yeah, it's not popular to say the least, but it's biblical. And I pray you really help us this morning journey through this question together, Lord. Bless us, let us hear your word, let us be obedient to it and serve you. And learn from you. One of the kind of books that I've worked that I'm now handing on to Lorraine because she wants to read it. Uh, 85 pages, about 30 minutes. Um, is is called Hell? Is it uh, is it for real or is everyone going to heaven? Um, and that's uh, kind of one of the resources I used um, just working through uh, stuff. So if you want to get that, um, kind of get the title. For, it's about three pound uh, at Amazon or at your local bookstore storehouse. Probably ask Andy Clark. He would know. Probably cheaper than Amazon. There you go. So go to your local storehouse just for some help. It's really insightful. Um, I just wanted Gemma to read uh, Luke 16 to kind of set it in place that um, one of the commentators I read said, for a doctrine of hell, to find the source of the doctrine of hell, you have to go to Jesus. Now, most people would say the one thing Jesus wouldn't ever think of doing is being unloving or even consider a, a, a place where people are punished for sin. Um, it's our modern kind of world that, 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 that one thing Jesus isn't, he's love, but he, he wouldn't ever consider talking about anything like that. 13% of Jesus's words were about hell or judgment or eternal life after death. Um, and so uh, he spoke about it more than any other New Testament writer. Um, and so it was very much something that he uh, was aware of and spoke into and I feel it's very much something that x1 needs to be aware of and it's very much something unbelievers will say to you yeah that's where you guys are totally weird is on this hell thing um and I want to start with this we we, I think each of us as as, um preachers or teachers have kind of started each of our sermons I haven't been able to listen to um Duncan's yet I heard it was great um but I haven't had to listen like prefaced what we're saying with the fact that Culture has shifted massively. Spent some time with Lincoln and Yvonne last night and just chatting to Lincoln about how, uh, uh, and Kirillie actually finally said it, um, the last 40 years, everything's just, just rapidly changed. And our culture has rapidly changed. Our, our po- culture is called a post-Christian co- culture. Lincoln Tapper, one of, our, one of our men, said, it's almost like it's pre-Christian again. We've gone back to genuine paganism of the second and third century. Most people do not know there's a Bible, never alone if you said to them, can you name three disciples? They, they wouldn't know there's a Bible of two testaments. It's just absolutely thoroughly lost world. And some of the under, underarching or undergirding things that have brought about where people are at is, is just the nature of our times. And particularly as we broach subjects like hell, we need to understand where people are at. And I feel we need to understand our contemporary uh, sort of setting, where we are in Watford today, um, through this kind of tripartite filter. Three, three things I'd want us to just very briefly have a look into. Now, my thoughts would be uh, most... Traditionalists, so I'd say most people who kind of have church in their life, so most people probably over 45, probably over 60 definitely, will not question hell. They'll question maybe the outright authority of Jesus to be the only one who keeps you from there. But hell will be in their system because of Sunday school when they were young or kind of growing up in a culture where Christian culture was the culture. But most people, definitely people under my age, probably my generation, Gen X, Gen Y, etc., this is not going down with them. And this is why I would say why we live in a, just think of, think of our culture through three lenses. Andy Clark, who's going to kind of focus on um, where the kind of main thinkers have got the world today um, as a sermon in a few weeks' time. Um, we'll, we'll tackle this more fully. But if you just come with me quickly before I get kicked off. 
our culture is secular. It's secularist materialist. It, it's, it's a culture that believes all that exists is only what can be seen and touched. There is nothing more than the this. There is no other realm. There is no transcendent thing. There's just stuff. All that exists is this. Therefore, if you think about the conclusion of that, if you were to die, you just rot. So that is a, a governing major pillar of thought today. So really, um, you go to a funeral today, there'll be some people who are uh, just wonderfully said yesterday, um, it's like a memorial, it's a, it's a remembrance of such a great life, what it's not as a focus on the life to come. Because there is no life to come, it's done. You know, Joe was such a great dude, remember that time? <laughs> he was great, now he's just going to get eaten by worms, so we don't do anything further. So we live in a secular, all of that exists is, is, is this, the material stuff. The people are living in that world. So when you bring up an idea of something after death, the door closes. Another part, another f- pillar that undergirds our, our, our con- context, our culture, is we are unbelievably individualist. We literally live the world through a capital I. Or a capital M-E. Everything revolves around. It's like seeing a little baby. Babies are um, radically egotistical until two or three years old. They only understand the whole world through the lens of how they're interacting with it. But now people are fully grown adults. They, they live life going, it's all about me. I am the center of the universe. And there can be no external or transcendental value. There certainly is no other who's above all of this being able to speak into my life because my life is about me. I am the individual. I'm the ultimate reality. And so that impinges upon, so, so nothing can impinge or have a say upon my thought because I am the ultimate individual. I am the center of the known universe. Timothy Keller writing um, in, in, in that second book actually says, the most fundamental belief in contemporary Western culture is that moral truth is relative to the individual consciousness. No one else can tell you what's right or wrong. What is right or wrong is what I decide. And that's actually exacerbated, made worse by this thought. We live in a psychotherapeutic culture. Everything is feeling. So actually what's true is what I feel about reality. What's true is I don't think this is a good church because I don't feel the worship suits my needs. That is the truth of this church. Not what is the truth, some objective thing. No, the truth would be, I don't feel um, homosexuality is wrong. I, don't feel, I must go with my desires. I want to sleep with her. She's so beautiful. And I feel that's right. So it must be true. And this is the kind of Freudian, you know, Freud just unearths the fact that what we are is what we kind of feel deep inside. Our great friend Oprah, that, that's how she's made all her money. How, how do you feel? And what does that make you feel? And... Uh, the feelings are the reality of what's really going on. And, and so that's where we live. That, and that exacerbates this individual. So it becomes this world where all that exists is this. I am the center of this. And how I feel about things is all that exists. And is, that's the truth. And so when you kind of, kind of come to speak about something like how, I think it's important you understand the times we live in. We're not just talking to another people who as wholeheartedly as us believes in this. You're not even talking to someone who believes in Christian morals. You're not even talking to someone who thinks that other people can have a say on their truth. I believe what I believe. I'm glad you believe what you believe. That's the world we're living in. And so we come to what is, I would say, the unpopular doctrine. Okay. Now, it's always funny for me. But there was an evangelical craze that started with a book written by Rob Bell uh, called Love Wins. And it was almost like, oh my word, he's discovered new truth. <gasps> he believes that maybe, just maybe, love is the strongest thing. It'll win out and no one will go to hell. That, wow, no one ever thought of that. The thing is that it exposes just the fact that we are so badly read and so unaware of our history that actually a man in the third century AD, origin, brought up this doctrine. So Rob Bell was great to bring it up, but he was 1,720 years late. So it's great. Whoa, Rob Bell, wow, whoa, this is brand new stuff. Wow, he changed. No, it's 1,700 years old. 
There's always been a substream, a very substream of the fact that universalism, perhaps everyone will be saved. This started in the third century. The thing that happens with Rob Bell is that it comes into the evangelical world predominantly. One of the dudes of the evangelical world is saying, maybe, just maybe, everyone is saved. And so it comes with real force. And obviously, everything kind of, whoa, how do we deal with this? But we must understand that in AD 553, in the uh, Council of Constantinople, um, Origen's view of universalism were unilaterally declared heretical because all the church fathers and 97% of church history and the major thinkers and the major men and women that have led us in the past believe in the doctrine of hell. And so 553, so 1,500 years ago, what Rob Bell is proposing, what others propose, it's not just Rob Bell, others propose was declared unilateral. This is heretical. Jesus speaks more about hell than anyone. But it's an unpopular doctrine. One of the authors I was reading says it, it, it's, it's very much um, the kind of the effect of the 19th century into the 20th century, the effects of uh, Victorian biblical criticism. So suddenly this is no longer read as the truth of God's word. It's read as a document like any other book. And parts of it that seem a bit miraculous and seem a little bit weird. Oh my word, he works on water. No, that was the disciples trying to make Jesus into a bigger guy than he really was. So we'll take that bit out. Jesus feeding 5,000 people with um, loaves of bread and fish. <laughs> it's nice that they think that, but it couldn't be. Real. We'll take that bit out. So basically, you remove all the miraculous. You remove anything where Isaiah prophesies the name of Cyrus hundreds of years before his existence, uh, the king of Persia. No, what happened was Isaiah was written in two stages, and what this is is a second Isaiah writing back. I mean, that to me is harder to believe than just the fact God inspired Isaiah with the name Cyrus. But hey, or it's actually Xerxes. I'm not sure which it is. But so you, you have Victorian biblical criticism, and suddenly this is no longer the measure of truth. It is absolutely and totally by our time undermined. It's just another book. It's the book those crazy Christians believe in. Huh, what are they up to? So... In this kind of Victorian biblical criticism and this Victorian philosophy, which was defined by romanticism. Oh, everything is really love. And love is actually not what we've understood as the biblical picture of divine love. Love is Shakespeare. Yeats. It's, 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 this, it's this wonderful, poetic, romanticized ideal. And so certainly you cannot understand any form of wrath or anger being combined with that type of love. So... Guys, there it is again. This thought pattern shapes a whole culture. And then what kind of happens is through the 20th century, you've got guys who lived through the two world wars and they basically go, whatever hell is, it's hell on earth. It, it can't get worse than this. We've, we've lived through hell. This was hell. And so this suddenly comes alongside this biblical criticism, this undoing of the idea of divine love into a romanticized love. And then you've got alongside of that, this kind of concept of, no, we've lived hell. We've, we've done hell already. And it just undoes any idea of uh, what perhaps we'll see as a biblical doctrine of judgment and eternal punishment after death. It just, it just goes. And then what comes alongside that finally is... Um, a kind of mythological cosmology. The Bible is not a reflection of how the world is. It's like, a, it's like a mythological way the world exists in a kind of the dreams of the disciples. And so this is just literally totally undermined. I'm not talking about guys outside the church, by the way. I'm talking New Testament scholars. They just go, really, in the end, this is just a, a mythological cosmology. Their idea of the world is, 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 is a myth idea. It's not truth. And so enter our generation or enter generations since. And you're suddenly, if you believe in the doctrine of hell, as I do, you're an absolute weirdo. I mean, beyond all understanding. But it enters evangelicalism, not with Rob Bell. Through 1974 to 1991, one key British biblical scholar called John Wenham starts writing, no, 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 there, there, there's, we need to understand hell in a totally different way. John Stott suddenly says, what I think is going to happen is something called annihilationism. 
what will happen is they, the, the fire that burns and whatever that means will kill people instantly. Everyone will be annihilated. There will be no existence for those who did not follow Jesus. There will only be the eternal existence of those who love God. Um, so uh, Stott says, I'm sorry, something moved up there. I find the concept of eternal punishment, torment, intolerable and don't understand how people can live with it without cauterizing their feelings. John Stott, the central evangelical scholar, English evangelical scholar of the last 50 years. And I love his heart in that. It just seems too hard to take. So I'm going to believe in a hell, there's a punishment, but it'll end up being not, not eternal. And then you've got Clark Pinnock, who wrote a, a book in 1990. Let me say at the outset that I consider the concept of hell as endless torment in body and mind, an outrageous doctrine, a theological and moral enormity, a bad doctrine of the tradition which needs to be changed. We are dealing with an unpopular doctrine here, uh, uh, doctrine here, my friends. You've got guys that we would cherish much of their theology saying, I don't think so. So what I just want to do today is kind of just go through several things, just Work through, does the Bible have much to say? What is judgment according to the Bible rather than according to culture? What is hell, perhaps? And then what do our conclusions need to be? And how can we understand a God who is pure love, perhaps being angry at sin? So we're going to try to do that this morning if you're willing to go with me. So is this biblical? Well, every New Testament author writes about the coming future judgment or hell. Every New Testament author writes about it. As I said earlier, Jesus, 13% of his words are about this context. So we'll start with Matthew. Okay. Um, normally I'd read quite a few bit of scripture from the Bible, but I'm going through a lot of verses. So if you want to take the verse notes down and read with, with me, that would be fantastic. Matthew 5 verse 22. And we could certainly do an Old Testament doctrine of this quite easily. So I just want to go through this. I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council, and whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. Jesus. Matthew 18, verse 8 and 9. And if your hand or your foot causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life crippled or lame than with two hands or two feet to be thrown into the eternal fire. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. It is better for you to enter life with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into the hell of fire. Jesus continues, or um, it talks about, Jesus is talking about the end time. Matthew 25, where Jesus separates, the King of kings, the Lord of lords comes, separates those that were like sheep and like goats. Not They didn't become sheep and goats. And he separates them and he will say to those on his left, those who did not give water to the thirsty, those who did not visit the prisoner in prison, those who did not show mercy and social um, justice as part of their lives, he will say, you're going to go on the left. Those of you who followed me and sought to be like me and have showed love and mercy, you're on the right. And he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We move into 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. Paul, the apostle who's planted the church in Thessalonica, um, is writing to them. He's gone away and uh, things have come in. He just wants to write and encourage him. Encourage him. So Paul, um, who wrote much of the New Testament, um, inspired by God to write the words. Um, Peter, another apostle, says, Paul, inspired by God. We need to listen to his readings, his writings. Write to this. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction, away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. There seems to be an implication there, very obviously, that there is an offer to believe something. There is an offer to become a saint by believing in the gospel, the message that Paul's already shared with them. Or there is an offer of refusing that and being asked to depart and pursue the eternity you want away from God. Second Thessalonians. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Peter, who wrote the same verse we've been kind of saying together, you need a testimony, you need an answer for your faith. 
writing again to persecuted um, uh, people throughout the diaspora, as he calls it. He writes again. But by the same word, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and the destruction of the ungodly. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, 11. Written by the love apostle. John is known as the love guy. He's just the big huggy, I just love you dude. He's the Jerry Abraham of the Bible. <laughs> Give me your babies, I just want to hold them. Do you want to hug? I'll hug you. Receive the love. He's known as the love apostle. He's the love dude, the love doctor. He writes in Revelation. As revealed to him by the Spirit. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and the springs of water. Another angel, a second, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. And another angel, a third, followed them saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or on his hand, he also will drink the wine of God's wrath, poured full strength into the cup of his anger, and will be tormented with fire and sulfur in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. Revelation is a, an apocalyptic book. It is a whole revelation to um, John exiled on the island of Patmos, and he receives a revelation of what the end times will be like. And there's a lot of imagery, the imagery of a beast, the imagery of um, um, sort of vials of sulfur and, and, and shining lights. But th what comes through the apocalyptic language, this end times language, is the truth of what it will be like. And so that's John writing. He writes finally one chapter before the end of the Bible. And the devil who had deceived them, the, 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 the saints and, and others, was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were, and they will be tormented day and night, forever and ever. My only conclusion after just reading scripture, so I'm just, let's just stop there. After reading scripture, is my understanding is that hell is a reality. And hell is an eternal outworking of the rejection of the offer of the gospel and of Jesus Christ. We'll work through how various authors express that. But it is an eternal judgment for, an eternal distance from, eternal casting away of those who said, you know, Jesus, your whole plan of salvation and all that jazz... <laughs> I actually prefer to worship myself. I love the sex I'm having. I love the career I'm pursuing. I, I, the whole idea of love and one person having to die for the sins of the world. <laughs> you can keep that. And so there comes a time where the great judge, Jesus himself, will say, then depart ye, go into that which you have chosen, that which you have rejected has led you into this. So just after scriptures, that's where I stand. You may not stand there. You can explain away as much scripture as you want. That's about one third of them, by the way. But that would be my, as, as a teacher of God's word, that would be my conclusion just after those scriptures. So is it biblical? Hell is biblical. You might explain away what that type of hell is, but how the idea of a place of judgment for those who refuse the love and mercy of Christ is biblical. But what is Judgment. Well, we've got a modern idea of judgment. We've got a modern idea of justice. And the modern idea of justice, the contemporary idea, is all about restoration rather than retribution. It's all about, well, we know he killed 60 people, but why don't we just kind of love him a bit, care for him, and uh, hopefully over some time, this guy's going to come right, and we can release him into the world and just let him be a nice guy. That is the predominant understanding of what justice is. It's restoration, not retribution. So the idea of he who takes a life, his life must be taken, which started as early as Genesis chapter 9, is rejected. Now we can go into a long dissertation about capital punishment, etc., etc. But what I'm saying is the idea of retributive justice 
And the Bible never said that the whole way it should always be is an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. That is in the context of the law, the context of there needs to be similar punishment for action taken. But that's changed. That is no longer the idea of justice. So when you talk about God being just, you talk about God judging, that is, you're sharing that in the light of people saying, yeah, but what God would really want to do is just pat everyone on the back, give them a little kick up the bottom for being naughty, and then just let them go their own merry way. You see, not only is justice now about restoration rather than retribution, it is so inconsistent and confusing. Modern justice, I'm just going to say it straight out to the modern justice system, without saying anything, again, it, it's just confusing to me. It, it, it's just so inconsistent. I'm going to bring up a man that I deeply loved who passed away. and I, I, I'm with Humphrey Chemabus pursuing to stay in our country. One of the most noble men I've met. No chance. Like rejected a million times. At the same time as we're getting to the kind of final days of really hoping that it's going to work out for Humphrey, who's a wonderful member of our church, passed away last year, if if you've not been with us. There is an Eastern European man who killed a child in a drunk driving incident who appeals and says, but I've got really nowhere to return to and is instantly granted asylum in our country. I'm not saying who's right or please. I'm just saying "Mm, a little inconsistent for me. Totally confusing. If you kill a kid when you're drunk, you've got much more chances of staying here than if you're a noble New Testament believer who wants to serve his town. Little, mm, it's not as clear cut as that, I'm sure, but mm, random. What strikes me so much is the punishment dealt out to rapists. Quite often they get away with anything less than six months. So you've got people who have taken, literally ripped out the identity of a woman... Yeah, you shouldn't have done that, you naughty boy. Here's a few months, maybe an extended sentence if you're naughty in jail, but maximum three, four years. But then you get men this week incarcerated, put in prison for between four and nine years for talking about terrorist actions. For talking about it. I mean, talk about justice. You have raped someone, all the evidence necessary. Naughty boy, I hope you sort it out. You're thinking about, possibly talking about, there's things we can see that you will probably do. You're in jail. Nine years. Now, man, terror, deal with, but I'm just, what consistency is there? Are you hearing what I'm saying? That's modern justice. (laughs) This is the weirdest of all things on earth. You can abort your child in America up until full term if you want. Legally. But the moment that child is born, the moment that baby goes boop into time, how dare you smack that kid? Do you, guys, it's not so weird. It's absolutely absurd. It's like absurd theater before our eyes. When it's in the woman's womb, it is the most unprotected individual in all of history. It can be murdered. No problem. You have no rights. You're just a thing. You are the most worshipped thing in our culture. How dare you smack your child? You can't discipline. We have a say how you deal with Modern justice, well done. But what? So let me just say this. As you're defending how to your friends, you want to say to them, I prefer to deal with a form of justice where there is eternally, morally right, glorious king making the choices than what you're considering justice to be. So what is judgment? I took a little long there, but I felt I wanted to drive it home. Justice, judgment seems to be, from the Bible, there seems to be three kind of key depictions that almost portray multiple vantage points of what is judgment. It seems to be punishment. There's a conscious eternal suffering. It seems to be destruction, a continual undoing or disintegration of the self. And you know what? You see people that are heading for hell when you hang out with them already. It's like their self is disintegrating. They're absolutely messed up. They're always bitter. They're always angry. They're always, there's this moaning. There's, there's, it's like the self is, they're, they're not happy with just being. They're disintegrating. They're morally, they're losing the plot and anger and bitterness and, 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 and fear and concern and all these things. And, and, and literally, it, it's, it's a continual undoing, a disintegrating of the self. You, you will be destroyed. And banishment. There seems to be a saying by God, you are separated or excluded from this wonderful, glorious, 
presence because it's what you chose. There's a separation away from God from any ounce of his goodness and from any of his grace. Grace is that we breathe oxygen. You sit in a car with the exhaust coming and you breathe in carbon monoxide, you will die instantly. Grace is that we walk in a world where oxygen and our lungs interact phenomenally, hemoglobin in the body, and you breathe and live. It seems to be that you will be banished from all of God's goodness, his presence, and his grace. And these three ideas flow naturally from three things. It flows naturally from the biblical portrait of sin. Sin seems to be about being against God, about becoming increasingly distant from who he is, about taking life of others, about being, um, uh, it's like a, a, a working out of evil that is within you. It illustrates the biblical doctrine of atonement. Atonement means at one minute. The whole death of Jesus Christ was that God himself saw that we were no longer at one with him. There was a distance. We had rebelled. We had chosen as humanity to go our own separate ways and to reject the love of God. Christ Jesus is the son of God sent to at one us with God. To make the perfect payment and to restore the distance through his death, his burial, his resurrection, defeating sin and death itself, the power of sin. He makes us at one with God. But if you choose to reject that offer of at one atonement, you're not going to be one with God, are you? You're going to be away from God. The natural extension of that is banishment. Well, that's what you chose. You didn't want to be at one with me. You wanted to be at one with yourself and your other mates that never wanted to be at one with me. And it certainly contrasts the biblical doctrine of salvation. To be saved is to be in the presence of God, enjoying his glory and his joy and his wonder and his presence forever and ever and ever. Hell just seems to be the contrast of that. You see, one thing you've just got to hold in place is the antinomy. In other words, two things that look absolutely true, that are absolutely true, that are together, but seem they could never be together. There is an antinomy between the fact that God is absolutely, totally sovereign over every life, but that people are righteously judged according to their own deeds. Well, which one is it, Simon? It's both. No, but which one is it really? Both. No, no. Which one is it more? Both. Which one is it? Am I judged because I choose to be away from God or am I judged because God is sovereign over my life? And both. No, but which is it? Both. God is sovereign over each and every individual's life, yours today, mine, and you will choose by according to your deeds and according to the working out of your life whether you go to be in God's presence or not. It, it, it just it hangs there. It, it, the Bible portrays that's the way it is. So I just want to read some thoughts about how Great teachers, I think, have sought to express hell. Thomas Watson, beautiful Puritan writer, writes this. The greatest judgment God lays upon a man in this life, it's not up there, this is one alone, is to let him sin without control. When the Lord's displeasure is most severely kindled against the person, he does not say, I will bring the sword and the plague on this man. But he says, I will let him sin on. So I give them up to their own heart's lust. Psalm 81. Thomas Watson is saying the greatest judgment God can give against a sinner is to let him go on in his sin. Timothy Keller writes, Hell is simply one's freely chosen identity apart from God on a trajectory into infinity. C.S. Lewis, Great Divorce, wonderful book. This is a quote from there. There Well, it's actually not, but where Keller gets his doctrine of hell from is primarily C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis writes this, There are only two kinds of people. Those who say to God, thy will be done, or those to whom God in the end says, thy will be done. All that are in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, it wouldn't be hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. The boy is an absolute hedonist. Having held the glory of God in contempt through ingratitude and distrust and disobedience, those without Christ are sentenced to be excluded from the enjoyment of that glory forever and ever. In the eternal misery of hell. John Piper. Guys, this is not supposed to sit well. Because it is the most absurd conclusion to the glory of a human life. That's why it's hell. I'm going to go on five minutes. Apologies. To understand God's love and judgment working together. 
You need to understand these three terms just quickly. I'm hoping this will help. God is absolutely independent and needs no one for his existence. So when God judges, when God does what he does and judges, there will be no favorites, no bribes, no buying a place in the Bahamas for him so that you get in. He will judge with absolute, independent, glorious, unmarked, unfaltering authority. Because that is who he is. God is absolutely simple. The being of God is identical to the attributes of a God. Of God, What that means is, you can't say God at one stage. You see, I can at some stages be loving and kind to Kirli, and the next day, she'll confirm this, I can be ungracious and unkind. God can never do that. God can never stop being all that he is. God is love. God is righteousness. God is uh, justice. God is compassion. God is holiness. And he is always those things. He will never be one instead of the other. He will never display his holiness upon Kirili, but because he's got a favorite in me, display his love. He will always be lovingly, holily, just and compassionate in all of his judgments because he has to be. There is no distinction. God is not like a dog. You can cut off his tail and still be a dog. There is no part of God you can remove from him and he stops being God. He is exactly and absolutely one of simplicity. So every judgment he makes, every decision he makes will always be governed by all that he is. There will never be favorites. There will never be a loving judgment and an unjust judgment or a just judgment and an unloving judgment. It will always be perfectly, lovingly, just, righteous, holy, compassionate, and true. Because he can't not be that. So what is divine love? Psalm 145, 17 through 20. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and kind in all his works. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desire of those who fear him. He also hears their cry and saves them. The Lord preserves all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. You see, the cross of Christ is the great sign that rises over all of reality and stands at the center of all history, testifying to the truth that God is perfectly loving and perfectly just. And he couldn't let sin just ride and he couldn't just abuse and destroy everyone. He had to show his love and his justice. Okay, what's going on? I've got three conclusions I feel that we need to make. To hold on to. Offense that God will judge perfectly rather than offense taken that a holy God would love a rebellious people so fully so completely such as to offer his son as a sinless substitute to reconcile them from their sin-induced separation from them is the overt proof that we are blind to the true nature of God. That we would be more offended that God would judge those who've chosen to be apart from him than we are offended by the fact that God would love us so much that he'd send his one and only son is the greatest proof that we just don't get God. Every Christian in this room should be more offended that God would send his son to love us. Second conclusion, God alone, the God who sent his own son out of radical love for his people, he alone can be trusted to ensure that a just ruling is made over every individual that has lived. He that is perfectly holy, perfectly compassionate, perfectly righteous, perfectly forgiving, and perfectly just is said by the scriptures to be the one that will be handled the final judgment of those who have chosen to follow or reject the truth of nature, Romans chapter 1 and 2, or the special revelation of Jesus and the scriptures. The Bible says he will be handed, this perfectly righteous, compassionate, just one, will be handled judgment at the end of times. So to me, the choice is glaringly simple and remarkably important. Will you choose to accept the love of God in Christ? Or will you choose to refuse that? And whatever hell may metaphysically be, what it actually will be, choose to be there distant from God rather than receiving the promise of love from God. That's the question that you can perhaps answer the question with.